Okay, well, thanks for joining me today. Uh, let's start with a quote, because that's how I like to start my lessons. The desire to fly is an idea handed down to us by our ancestors, who, in their grueling travel across trackless lands and prehistoric times, look enviously at the birds soaring freely through space, at full speed, above all obstacles, on the infinite highway of the air. Wilbur Wright. Here's a flight plan. We'll start with a short intro. We'll get into an instrument topic, a uh, cockpit check, and then we'll do a private pilot topic, uh, the traffic pattern. We'll do a Q&A, and then we'll make a plan for uh, for next week. If you have any questions at any point, please just feel free to ask. Okay, who am I? Uh, for those of you who might not know me, uh, I know it's just two of us right now, but uh, anybody else who might be watching this later, my name is Monty. I'm a U.S. Army veteran, a flight instructor, ground instructor. Uh, I'm a mechanical, mechanical engineer, and I love helping people earn their wings. I founded the Husky Aviation Club at UW Bothell and the Emerald Squadron Aviation uh, business as well. Yeah. Okay, so here, let's start with our instrument cro uh, cockpit check. Now, the objective, the student should develop knowledge of the elements related to checking the instruments prior to flight. Why do we care? In instrument conditions, I mean, in aviation in general, but in instrument conditions, we really want to set the cockpit up uh, so that everything is set for us so we don't have to think as much while we're in the air. Uh, we want to do as much of the hard work or the tedious work on the ground uh, so that we can focus on the flying tasks in the air. Uh, the key elements above all else, if you remember nothing else from this lesson, I want you to remember that you need to develop a plan or develop a pattern and stick with it. Now, the elements we're going to cover are on right here. We're going to talk about uh, communica communications uh, radios, nav radios, the compass, the uh, horizontal situation indicator, the attitude indicator, the altimeter, turn slip coordinator, the vertical speed indicator, airspeed, outside air temperature, the clock, pitot heat, the primary flight display, traffic and terrain awareness, and the flight man management system, and the autopilot. Hope I'm not going too fast. I tend to speak fast, so if I am going too fast, please let me know. All right, so I have a uh, cockpit already set up for an instrument flight. Now, first of all, before we go fly in instrument conditions, we need to file a fly plan, and uh, ATC, or clearance delivery, will give us a clearance, and it looks like this, craft. It starts with our clearance. We are cleared to, in this case, Olympia. The route via uh, the Payne 6 departure, then to RP, then to 267, and then as filed. Our altitude, 3,000 feet. They uh, will tell you what altitude to climb to and what altitude to expect after a certain amount of time. The frequency uh, you're going to talk to after you talk to tower and the transponder squat code. So it'll sound like this. Cessna 172 Sierra Papa, you're cleared to Olympia uh, via the Payne 6 departure that has filed. Climb and maintain 6,000, uh, expect 5,000 five, expect 5, five minutes after departure. Uh, contact Seattle departure on 128.5 and squawk 0275. And you'll repeat that. And if you got everything right, uh, ATC will tell you to talk to ground and you'll be good to go. So that's kind of the uh, warm up there. And now when we're ready to depart, we want to make sure our cockpit is set up uh, so that everything is covered. We st I like to start with the very top, the compass. I want to make sure that our compass is aligning correctly with the magnetic field of the planet. Uh, so if you are on a known heading like 340 or 343, technically, I want to make sure that this is indicating correctly. Good to go. And then I like to go from top to bottom. Starting from the top left, our nav radios here. Now we have the uh, pain field VOR plugged in. And then on standby, I have my next navigational radio ready to go. On the second nav radio, I have the um, second waypoint. Uh, RP is identified by pain and by this additional frequency. So it's on the uh, nav two. And then on nav two standby, I have the next frequency that I'm planning on using. So I've got four frequencies dialed in, ready to roll. Next, I've got my GPS data. Looks like it's correct. Our comm radios are also staged. We have tower followed by Seattle departure. And then we have uh, Olympia's weather dialed in. And then we have Payne's weather dialed in for when we come back again. So I have all four frequencies staged, ready to roll. So I don't have to think about it while I'm flying. All right. So going down, uh, we have our heading bugged right there. That's the uh, departure heading uh, for our Payne 6 departure. Uh, usually a cockpit check will also include a, um, a checklist. So you go from left to right. Airspeed zero, wings are level, nose is approximately on the horizon. Turn slip coordinator is, for the most part, centered. Uh, our altimeter is set, 2997 in this case. We have our alt altitude bugged based on the route or the altitude they uh, assigned us. Vertical speed zero, we're not climbing or descending. Uh, and our uh, minimums are already plugged in for our uh, arrival. Cool. 
Uh, so moving from uh, left to right again, we have the um, moving map here on the primary flight display. And now we have our heading, our horizontal situation indicator, and it has everything I need for navigation already set up. And I'm going to switch uh, slides here in a second so we can look at it better. Uh, continuing on, we've got our flight plan plugged in, and I verified all my waypoints are good to go. Our transponder is set. Uh, by the way, that's a special uh, spot code. Let me know if you know what that means. Uh, and then we've got our uh, DME pulled up as well. Now looking at our backup instruments, uh, airspeed zero, our uh, attitude indicator is uh, set correctly for my vision. And then we have our backup altimeter set as well. So all that is good to go. Um, and then you could also look down here for your lights, pedo heat, and that kind of stuff. Continuing on, uh, we have our um, multi-function display, or yeah, uh, it's set up pretty much the same way. Our nav and comm radios, GPS is all set. Our tachometer, fuel flow, oil pressure, oil temperature, basically we're just running through, making sure everything looks like it's in the green and we're all set. And you can also plug in, uh, in certain aircraft, your terrain and collision avoidance into the moving map. And you can set this up to either track uh, your track up or have north always be up and your plane uh, will change its orientation. I like to have that. I like to have north up personally. Uh, it's funny because in the army, we always use uh, your track up. But for some reason, I just like having the plane uh, change its orientation and north always be up. And then you've got your uh, autopilot uh, buttons here, autopilot, uh, your flight director. Basically, you want to you want to know how to use your flight, your autopilot ahead of time, so you're not trying to figure it out on the flight. All right, moving on. Uh, here, I built in the flight plan, and it goes from Pain to RP to Jevka uh, via the airway Victor 20, uh, 287. And then I've got the approach plugged in. And so, um, Primarily using GPS for this route, I've got a heading bug uh, for our departure. And then on nav one, I have the pain VOR set up to identify RP, and I've got the DME. So if for whatever reason, my other nav radio fails, I also have a distance so I can gauge my distance on the line from pain. And I've got my second nav set up as well. Bam. Okay, so that... I know it went kind of fast, but that is a typical uh, cockpit check for your um, for an instrument flight. And that should cover the PTS for the CFII cockpit instrument check uh, for the check. Right. Questions? I think it's about it. Yeah. No? Awesome. All right, let's move on. Uh, so that was our instrument discussion. Moving on to private pilot level discussions now. Um, we're going to talk about the traffic pattern. Uh, we're going to do a hands-on acti activity if you guys are feeling up for it. If not, totally cool. And then uh, we're going to practice determining our attitude and position uh, in the in the pattern. All right, so let's start with a warm-up. Let's say you were on uh, downwind base, and then you overshot the runway, and now you're trying to recorrect and align with the runway. What are you in danger of entering in this position? Any thoughts? Give me like 10 seconds. So if you overshoot the runway, this is the most likely place to spin the aircraft because you are low and slow and you are very likely uncoordinated. In this case, we are low, slow, and uncoordinated. And if we are focusing on getting back to the runway, this is the most likely area to spin the aircraft. Now, what is a spin? A spin is an aggravated stall. What's a stall? A stall is when you exceed the critical angle of attack and your wing stops generating lift. And if we have some sort of... Uh, uncoordination or some sort of yawing motion during the stall, uh, we are likely to spin the aircraft. And we can lose about 500 feet per minute or 500 feet per three seconds in a spin. So if you are, what, uh, 400 feet above the surface, you have less than three seconds to recover your aircraft from a spin. So this is the worst time and the most likely time to spin the airplane. So what do we do to recover? Uh, if you know your acronym PAIR, that's how you recover power idle, ailerons neutral, rudder opposite, and elevator forward. Uh, you would you really want to you know know this acronym well so that uh, you don't have to think about it when you've got less than three seconds to recover. So uh, so how do we prevent this? Make nice square patterns. If you are in this position when you are low, slow, overshot the runway, uncoordinated, just go around. Uh, go around is part of our toolkit. It's not an emergency procedure. Say, hey, pain tower, 
uh, two Sierra pop going around. And they'll be like, Roger that, make left traffic. Too easy. All right, let's talk about airports. There are two different flavors of airports on your chart. You've got your towered airports and your non-towered airports. By definition, a towered airport has a control tower and it's going to look blue on your, <clears throat> it's going to look blue on your, uh, on your chart. A non-towered airport is going to be magenta. And of course, by definition, there is no control tower there. So how do you know what to do at a non-towered airport? Well, the non-towered airport uh, pilots are, are basically on their own. Then you have to figure out how to enter the pattern, how to uh, maneuver and everything on your own. So we're going to talk about how to do that today. Towered airports are pretty easy. They tell you what to do. You repeat back and you do it. Bam. So let's talk about the standard entry into the traffic pattern. Uh, there are four legs. It's a rectangle, right? You've got, and it's all based on wind. If the wind is moving from our left to right, uh, then this leg here is the downwind leg. This leg here is the upwind leg. You've got base and you've got crosswind. Now there's a bit more to it, but in general, it's a rectangle. It's not super complicated. Uh, so as we approach the airport, we want to set up to enter at a 45 degree angle to the downwind leg. Uh, one second. Did I say wind is moving left to right? Yeah, sorry, I meant to say right to left. We want to land upwind. We want to land into the wind. My mistake. So yeah, uh, so we're going to enter on the 45 to the downwind leg. And then a standard pattern is going to be left traffic. So uh, we enter on the downwind, 45. And we want to be at about 1,000 feet, or exactly 1,000 feet above the runway. Uh, and we'll continue uh, to, again, about a 45 degree angle from our landing zone, turn base, and then final, and then land. And then uh, you've got the departure end here. Uh, you can depart at a 45 degree angle to the departure end or turn crosswind. You want to make this turn 700 feet above, and you want to make this turn 700 feet below traffic, or yeah, 700 feet above the surface here, and then uh, 700 feet above the surface as well here, or 300 feet below traffic pattern altitude. So 700 feet AGL. Uh, so here are some general rules you want to um, keep in mind. You want to enter the pattern at a thousand feet above the field, midfield on the downwind leg. You want to maintain that 1000 feet above the surface until you are beam the, the numbers. That's when you are in line with the landing, uh, landing target. Uh, you're going to descend uh, about 500 feet per minute uh, until you are 300 feet below traffic pattern altitude or 700 feet above the surface and then make your left turn to base. Uh, once you are uh, airborne, you wanna maintain runway heading until you are at least 700 feet above the surface and then turn crosswind or climb straight out or make a 45 degree turn. So again, uh, standard entry, 45 to the downwind, we should be landing with our nose into the wind because that's going to decrease our ground speed and give us the best performance. Uh, a beam the numbers will start descending. 700 feet above the surface will make our turn to base, make our turn to final, and then uh, we get to go and we can land. By the way, we don't try to land. We focus on slow flight over the run. Now, what happens if there are two runways, like at Payne Field? If you are making standard turns to both of them, you could conflict with other aircraft. So uh, some airports will have a uh, non-standard flow or right traffic. So in this case, the top side is going to be making left traffic. The bottom side is going to be making right traffic. And everything is the same. You still enter on the 45 to the downwind leg, turn base 700 feet above the surface, uh, turn final, slow flight over the runway. Don't try to land. Uh, depart uh, and then turn crosswind again 700 feet above the surface. The only difference now is that you're making right turns or right pattern instead of left pattern. I wonder, yeah. And if you ever are looking at an airfield and uh, you're not sure what direction to turn, if it says RP and a number, that says that the pattern for runway nine is right traffic. So you make right turns for that runway. If there is nothing, uh, if they don't have this, then you, are, you just assume it's left pattern. Okay, there's a bam. Uh, if you're move, if you're going to a non-towered airport and you're not sure about the direction or the um, the runway to land on because you're not sure what the winds are doing, what you can do is overfly the field 500 feet above traffic pattern. Remember, traffic pattern is a thousand feet above the field, so your overflight would be 1,500 feet above the field. 
you look down, look at the um, windsock or listen to other aircraft in the pattern, you're going to make a teardrop entry into the 40, uh, 45 and then uh, enter on the uh, downwind. This is not really the right way to do it. Uh, I've seen people do it before, but um, the safe way to do it would be extend out, do a teardrop and then enter on the 45. Cool. Let's talk about calculating crosswind. Any questions so far? Good. Awesome. <clears throat> I'm going too fast. Let me know. And I apologize for any uh, errors I make. All right. So why do we care about crosswind? Well, first of all, uh, why do we care about the wind in general? Uh, when we are trying to land an aircraft or when we're trying to depart, we really want to have as much of a headwind as possible because that will uh, because our aircraft doesn't really care where the ground is. We fly through the medium of air, through the fluid of air. Uh, so if the wind is calm and we are at 10 knots uh, airspeed, just for the sake of argument, uh, and there's no wind, we're going to be moving 10 knots over the surface, which is great, right? If the wind is pushing us back or pushing us forward at 10 knots, and we still have an airspeed of 10 knots, we're still moving through the air itself at 10 knots, then our ground speed will actually be 20 knots. And that could be good for us at altitude, but if we are approaching a tree or something similar at the end of the runway, that tree is gonna come up a lot quicker. If we are flying, again, at 10 knots through the medium of air, through the fluid itself, uh, but there's a 10 knot headwind, then we are gonna be stuck. We're going to be uh, on the ground. We can literally just climb up vertically. And uh, the airplane is flying through the air at 10 knots and the air itself is flying back toward uh, in the opposite direction at 10 knots. And that's great for us because then we don't have as much runway. We don't need as much runway to get up to our cruising altitude. And we can clear that obstacle much easier. So headwinds are great for departure. Tailwinds are great for uh, at altitude while we're cruising. And so now uh, that's all well and good. So why do we care about crosswind? Well, as we depart, if there is a crosswind, it'll make it really difficult. Well, it might make it more difficult to stay aligned with the runway uh, for both landing and departing. So we want to determine how much of a crosswind there is because uh, it can get more and more difficult the more wind there is coming from the right or the, from the left. So what we're going to do is figure out our landing uh, runway, let's say in this case, 340. And let's say the winds are coming from 290, right, at uh, 10 knots. Okay, we're going to subtract. Um, actually, let's make it a little easier. Let's do uh, 310 at 10 knots. We're going to subtract the difference between our wind and the runway, and that's, in this case, 30 degrees. We'll find our 30-degree line and find where the 10-knot arc is. Here it is. And it looks like we have a headwind component of about 8 knots, maybe and then a crosswind component of about five knots. Now, if you're a nerd like me, you can just use trigonometry uh, to figure this out. But if you don't like math, if you don't like trig, this is how you do it. Find the difference between your wind and your runway, find the uh, angle that that corresponds to, and find the airspeed uh, that the wind is reported at. And then you can read the headwind component and the crosswind component and determine whether or not it is safe to land. Now, remember, your POH will tell you uh, what the maximum demonstrated crosswind is for that aircraft. But you must assume that that pilot knew what he was doing, probably a, you know, an experienced test pilot. And you, are you an experienced test pilot? Probably not. Uh, so build your own personal safety mittens into uh, your calculations. All right. So what happens if you lose your radio? I have a question. Send it. Uh, on the crosswind component angle calculation uh we talked about that wind is at true and and runways are at mag is that factored into this uh this chart yeah if you read it it's true if you hear it it's magnetic uh so if you listen to the ATIS or the asos uh while you're um while you're coming into a field uh you can assume that the uh the wind direction is magnetic and so you can just do this calculation like, gotcha. So if you read it, it's true. If you hear it, it's magnetic. Yeah, that's how I like to remember it. Like, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. No worries. Okay, so what happens if you lose your radio? Uh, not a huge deal. <laughs> uh, stay calm, stay frosty. Uh, first of all, you're going to work the problem. See if uh, you can figure out what you know what's wrong with your radio. 
And then remember your, uh, you know, your transponder code seven, five, taken alive, seven, six radios next and seven, seven going ahead. So if at any point you have an emergency, like a hijack, lost comms or general emergency, uh, then you can squawk these codes on your transponder. In this case, we'll squawk 7600. And then we're going to observe the flow of traffic and see what direction they're landing. Let's say they're landing uh, right pattern uh, 16. And we're going to enter on that 45 and watch for a light gun signal from tower. And tower will either give you a steady green indicating you're clear to land, flashing green uh, telling you Actually, uh, yeah, return to land. You're probably not going to see that. Red, obviously, red is bad. Uh, give way to other aircraft. Uh, flashing red, it's unsafe to land. And then alternating red and green, uh, it's extremely dangerous. Or something is going on, so you need, you need to exercise extreme caution. Uh, I like to have this on my kneeboard. This is one of those things that uh, I recommend students have on their kneeboard um, when they're flying, so they don't necessarily have to memorize it. All right. Uh, some things you might hear from tower are you're cleared for the option or you're cleared touch and go or you're cleared to land. In general, you're going to respond with what they say uh, and execute. Uh, for example, if you're cleared for the option, they're saying you're pretty much cleared to either land or do a touch and go or do a go around. Um, and it's up to you. You're good to go. Uh, if you're cleared touch and go, that means that you are authorized to put your wheels down on the ground and then go and then you know take off again. And if you're cleared to land, that means you are cleared to do a full stop and taxi off the wrong way. Uh, just reviewing airport uh, communications or communications with the, uh, the tower. Typical radio calls will be like this. Hey, you, this is me. This is where I am. This is what I want. And this is what I know. Five parts. For example, Payne Tower, Cessna 243 at Echo at the central ramp for a westbound departure with Charlie. That's letting them know everything they need to know to give me the appropriate clearance to taxi to the runway. And then responding to the tower. So there are some key elements. Uh, you need to respond with the runway, uh, your clearance, and your uh, tail number or your call sign. Those are the big three. All right, so let's talk. Uh, here we are. We are somewhere in relation to the, to the runway. Here's the runway, right? Where are we in the pattern? And what are your remaining steps to land here? Give you a second to think about it. Uh, if we have, you know, if we're following what we've talked about before, this looks to me like we are on the downwind leg. Uh, and the following steps would be to get a beam the numbers, descend down 300 feet, make a base turn, and then turn final, and then turn and then fly in this direction to land the aircraft. Now, take a second to look at it. And where are we here in the pattern? Here, we're a beam the numbers. And so we can start our landing sequence. Uh, the way I teach it to my students in the 150 is we start from the left to the right. So carb heat, power, mix, flaps, 90 miles an hour, 500 feet per minute rate of descent. And we're going to continue descending down to 700 feet above the surface, make our turn to base, and then keep descending, and then turn to final. And then transition to slow flight over the runway, and don't try to land. All right, where are we here? Okay, we've continued uh, our descent. Now we are turning from downwind to base. Oh, that's not a good drawing. There we go, to base. We'll continue our descent, uh, continue, con continue to configure to land, and then turn final. And then again, slow flight over the run. All right, where are we here? We've overshot our turn from base to final. And like we talked about in the opening, we are at risk of stalling and spinning the aircraft when we are low and slow with very little time to recover. A good decision to make would be to go around. So add power, uh, execute a climb, and then advise ATC that you are going around. <clears throat> and here's what it would here's what it would look like from the inside the inside the cockpit. All right, so now we are 15 miles out to Jefferson. Uh, we haven't picked up the weather, or we've tried picking up the weather, but we were unable to listen to it. How might we determine what runway we're going to land at? I'll give you a minute, a second to think about it. Okay, if we can't pick up the weather, uh, we can overfly the field 500 feet above the traffic pattern altitude, and that in this case would be 1,500 feet above the surface, 
and we're going to overfly and look for a windsock or other aircraft in the pattern to determine what direction uh, to land it. And remember, we want to land with a face full of air, or we want to land into the wind. So looking down, here's our cockpit. Uh, we're looking down, looks like the wind is going in this direction. Uh, and so we're going to land in that direction so that we have as much of a headwind as possible. All right, so we're going to enter, we're going to overfly the field, extend out, execute a teardrop maneuver while descending to traffic pattern altitude. And we're going to say something like Jefferson traffic, Cessna 172 Sierra Papa is maneuvering for the 45 or is on the teardrop for the 45 left downwind runway 27 Jefferson. Now here we're going to enter again on the 45. Here's the, we're going to be landing in this direction. So we want to enter downwind base and final. And a typical radio call would be Jefferson traffic, 172 Sierra Papa is on left downwind runway 27 Jefferson. Uh, let's head back to Payne. This is how it's going to sound as you go back home. Um, we're going to pick up the radio, or we're going to pick up the weather on the radios like we normally do. Uh, and we're going to give them the five parts to a radio call. Hey, you, this is me. This is where I am. This is what I want. This is what I know. So Payne Tower, Cessna 172 Sierra Papa, 10 miles to the west. Uh, to land with information with Charlie, let's say. And then they will tell you, depending on what the direction of the flow is, either to enter on the left downwind for 3-4 left or the right downwind for 1-6 right. Uh, and you just respond with that call and then execute the uh, the maneuver. Uh, yeah, we're going to bypass this. Hey, Monty. Send it. Uh, one thing to add about the uh, overflying traffic pattern is um i think turbo props are 1500 right so i'm i'm always listening for uh turbo props in the pattern because if you're over flying you might intersect them they're they're all that's them yeah. yeah that's a good point yeah yeah so yeah some other some aircraft might have a different traffic pattern out too for us little guys uh with single engine props little baby props we're at a thousand thanks man okay cool um yeah this would be a fun exercise we're gonna bypass it though and this guy's are feeling up for it. Austin, I, I know you know how to do this. So. Oh, Brent. Brent's here. What's up, man? Hmm. Yeah, we're going to bypass. Cool. I'm listening from afar. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're just uh, running through a uh, traffic pattern discussion. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm watching. Uh, I'm just not close to my computer. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, so in the past, I've actually done this uh, exercise with like a large group of people and given the opportunity to like practice their radio calls. Uh, so yeah, you can do that on your own. We'll do that next time, maybe. Yeah, cool. All right, let's open it up. What do you guys think? Um, trying this out, trying some new stuff. Any feedback? Just generally about the the Zoom format? Yeah. Yeah, so I, in the past, I've done it through uh, through Discord and through YouTube. Um, not super happy with how the YouTube way panned out. Uh, I did a like a couple of months of that, and it just didn't get much interaction. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Sure. Yeah, I like uh, I like the whiteboard feature. Uh, you're gonna have to kind of show me how to use that. It looks like it's down here. Um, but yeah, that's it's nice, useful. <laughs> I love it. Uh, teaching tool, it seems like. I, mm -hmm. I understood everything that you were trying to get across. Cool. I know I tend to rush too, so I apologize for that. It'll take time. About five yeah. years of teaching, you won't rush anymore. Yeah. I like it. It's awesome. I like the I like the interactivity of it. Cool. Not to yeah. mention, I put this on my 80 inch so I can just watch the, like I can see the panel really close. Nice. That's cool. Really nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Cool. So moving forward, my objective is to practice my CF double I stuff here. Uh, I've done that in the past with my CFI stuff, and it was really helpful to me to get ready for my check ride. So I'll be doing that. Uh, and if you have any like topics you want me to cover, more than happy to do it. Um, if you guys want to share something you've learned throughout the week, like, hey, I did a flight this Tuesday and, you know, this is what I learned. I would love to see that. Uh, but no pressure if you don't want to do it. 
Uh, and Austin, if you're, you know, if you're interested in, you know, sharing your, or doing, you know, practicing your, uh, private pilot or question, uh, CFI stuff, um, you know, that'd be a great time too, if you're up for it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'd definitely be down for that. This is one thing I have from, uh, from instrument that I made that may be helpful for you. It's just like, a it's an approach checklist. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it'd be great I, if you could, if you could send that to me, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I'll write that down. Yeah. So, uh, a big thing that I want to do with Emerald Squadron is to develop that community feel. What I really didn't enjoy about other schools that I've trained at is that you only interact with the instructor and you might see other pilots, you know, as you walk out the door. Um, but I really want to build a community and like, you know, share what we've learned from each other. Um, I don't know, if you're interested. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's kind of the idea. So Brent, are you want you that share here? Yeah, yeah. If you if you uh, have something you want to share, uh, this might be a good way to to share it. Uh, since you know having everybody meet at the building might be difficult, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I like that. Anyways, yeah. Any other parting thoughts before we call it a day? So uh, in the, in the future, uh, when you do these, have perhaps have something ready to share is what you're saying. If you want, you you don't have to, right? Yeah, that's but. Yeah, but if uh, if you wanted to, that I think that'd be great. Uh, when I was at the Husky Aviation Club, what we do is we do this exact sort of thing. We'd start it with a uh, with an emergency procedure. So I'd be like, "All right, this is the situation. React, go." And then you know, one would like, "I would do this," and somebody else would be like, "I would do that." Like, great. Uh, and then we get into the topic, or we might do like a plane of the week, or somebody else might be like, "Oh, hey, I saw this really cool topic about aviation. Here's what I learned." And then, and then I would give my spiel, uh, to, you know, practice my CFI lesson plans and then, uh, open it up for an activity. Like this activity was really fun when we had like 10 people, you know, practicing their radio calls. Um, so. is, is it possible you could show, um, that that's a G5 in the 172, correct? Uh, yes. Is it possible you could show some, uh, some tricks to use on, oh, on yeah. that. you know, I'm an old, I'm an old guy. I only know how to look at that other instrument. Some, some of that newer, like I, I tried to look up the manual for it, but there's like 500 different choices. So I have to yeah. get this number or something. Yeah. Yeah. I can definitely do that. Sure. Is that something you could add in of like, Hey, let's, you know, talk, focus on this instrument for a minute and here's some of the tricks to the trade of how to use it properly. Yeah. That sounds great. I can do that. Hey, that Brent, awesome. there there's a uh there's an app on ipad there's like a garmin simulation app where you can go in and um like practice with all of their avionics oh that's awesome it, is it something that you could uh hold up to the screen and i could download yeah. let me find i'm gonna double click on you so i can see it better uh, GT this is... and trainer one second here okay so it's called garmin Okay, let me look and see if I can find it. Yeah, I'm gonna do that too. I did not know about that. Yeah, cool stuff, right? Learning from others. See what I mean? This is exactly what I'm talking about. In, in what the first five minutes? Okay, is it Garmin? When I search Garmin in my, it says Garmin GTN Trainer. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Um, and I'm going through it. So it gives you. So it doesn't have the G5, but it does have the 750 through the 600 series also which i'm not sure do we have those in the 172 monty i don't think so no no well garmin kind of operates other than g5 is kind of different but i mean their 650 is just a small g1000 <laughs> with touchscreen so okay that's helpful for you yeah that that's i appreciate that thank you Cool. Yeah. I'm also going to download. That's really cool. Awesome. All right. So uh, my intention is to do these once a week. Uh, if I can't, for whatever reason, I'll try to put out, you know, in our weekly emails, um, but plan on being here at zero nine. And then I'm toying with putting this on Emerald Squadron website rather than YouTube, just to, because I'm, I'm cautious about putting other people's faces on my YouTube channel out of respect for you guys. So I'll, I might just put it on the uh, on the Emerald Squadron web website for students to take a look at. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah I don't want to hurt I don't want to hurt your business model. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, that's not that's not it at all. It's just privacy uh, for you, actually, more than more than anything. You know what I mean? All right, you can Google me. I'm out there, so I'm good. I have awesome. a question. Can we invite other people that aren't affiliated with your hundred percent? hundred percent. Yes. Yes. That would be so cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I also invited the uh, Husky Aviation Club uh, to participate as well. So um, they participated through Discord before. Um, so we're going to see if they're going to like Zoom. Uh, but I, what I want to do is open it up to my current students as well and not just the Husky Flying Club. So, hey. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for uh, your time, guys. I really appreciate it. I'll see both of you tomorrow, I think. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Provided weather's good. Yeah. All right, guys. And night night flight, right? Uh, I don't think I'll be able to do a night flight tomorrow, unfortunately. Uh, I think we had the um, the day flight still planned. Okay. It's still on the calendar. Yeah, still on the calendar as a day flight. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to swing a night flight, unfortunately. Okay. I'll see you. Um, hey, I had, sorry, I had one more question for Brent. Uh, I'm going to plan on presenting some kind of private pilot related lesson. Is is that what you're working on is private? I am. Uh, is there anything specific that you, I don't know, need help with? Um, mostly modern instrumentation, navigation, and scavenger hunting for um, cross countries. It's uh, I'm an old school guy. I learned to do all this stuff in 91. So gotcha. Monty, Monty knows that I'm struggling with all the technology portions of it. I think I think he would agree that I'm pretty all right with the basics of the airplane. I just need the the technology sure all right cool i'll uh yeah when i'm uh looking at lesson plans i'll keep that in mind that's awesome, awesome. thank you yeah Sweet. man all right Great well thanks you. guys i really appreciate you guys hanging out with me today take care have a good weekend see you monty see you.